Hello, and thank you for being with us today. I'm Dr. Jim Lewis, founder of the Brain Injury Education Project. This video is for any woman who has experienced domestic violence or has struggled with alcohol or substance abuse. However, this educational video is specifically devoted to women in the Pasco County Adult Drug Court Program. What are we gonna cover in this video? We'll look at what is meant by neurotrauma in domestic violence, specifically how the two neurotraumas of concussion and hypoxia actually occur. Then we'll look at the symptoms that these injuries can cause. Then we'll see how to prevent future neurotrauma. And most importantly, we will look at your life choices that can create the best chances for brain healing after domestic violence neurotraumas have already occurred. This project is supported by a grant from the Federal Bureau of Assist uh, Justice Assistance. By necessity, this video does contain some graphic images showing facial, head, and neck injuries in domestic violence. But all of the images are stock photos of actors and actresses. There are no images <clears throat> or photos of actual patients or clients. So what actually is domestic violence? It's violence committed by someone in the victim's domestic circle. So what is the domestic circle? It includes current and former romantic partners. It could also be family members in the household. And sometimes it could be roommates or other so-called friends who may reside in your home. So there's something really important to understand. There's been a tendency to seriously underestimate how frequently domestic violence has actually occurred. There's actually a major misunderstanding about it. In fact, 90 to 95% of all domestic violence or DV victims experience brain injuries from either concussive blows to the head or hypoxia. We'll see as we go through this video that hypoxia involves injuries that disrupt the flow of oxygen to and from the brain. In spite of this high rate of 90 to 95% neurotrauma in domestic violence, only one or 2% of women DV victims actually have appropriate identification of these injuries. So if that's true, if so few injuries have typically been identified, then how do we know so much about brain injuries in DV? We actually know about it from discoveries made by Dr. Bennett Omalu. He began studying the devastating effects of multiple concussions on the brains of professional football players. Dr. Omalu is shown here with Will Smith, who played Dr. Omalu in the movie titled Concussion. Over the last two decades since Dr. Omalu's initial work, his warnings about repetitive head injury and concussion have reached down into college, high school, and even elementary and middle school sports. At the same time, some of us in the neurosciences have been warning about the exact same concussion mechanism of brain injury occurring with women victims of domestic violence. So what are some facts about uh, the actual occurrence of domestic violence injuries and how they're occurring? In fact, any part of the body can be targeted or injured in domestic violence. Some women are punched, kicked or stabbed in the stomach, the back, the chest or the legs. But the reality is 
that more than 90% of the time, the abuser actually targets the woman's head, her face, or her neck. Here are some images showing injuries that are capable of concussing the brain. Anytime a woman is punched, slapped, backhanded, or hit with a hard object in the face or the head, the brain can literally shake within the skull, causing a brief or longer period of concussion. So what are some other things that we know? Here's what happens in concussion. So I said the brain literally shakes within the skull. There are microscopic changes in small blood vessels, nerve fibers, and brain cells. A single one-time isolated mild concussion with no loss of consciousness usually does not cause any significant, major, or long-term consequences. So what is the real problem? The real problem is with repeated injury. The pink in this slide is the brain and the blue is fluid that surrounds the brain and spinal cord. This fluid usually provides a cushion from small falls or other mild bumps to the head. But domestic violence involves something totally different. It involves high speed, heavy blows to the head from being punched backhanded, slapped, or hit in the head with a fist or hard objects, or being pushed or slammed where the head hits into a wall or down onto the floor, a sidewalk or street pavement, or from being pushed down a flight of stairs. Here's some of the immediate symptoms of concussion. Some of these symptoms may last only a few seconds like feeling momentarily dazed, dizzy, stunned, woozy, or seeing stars. Later, you may have headaches or the feeling of a brain fog that just doesn't seem to go away completely, especially if you have repeat injuries. And also, there are concussion-related problems with attention and concentration. These mimic what occurs in adult attention disorder, also known as ADHD. But this is not the same as what occurs developmentally in some children. No, instead, this form of attention disorder is acquired as a direct result of concussive blows to the head and face. Here's some other difficulties that you can experience following repeated domestic violence concussions. You may begin having sudden mood swings that you didn't have before, that were not present in your life before these domestic violence concussions started to occur. And if mood symptoms were already present, they can quickly worsen after repeated concussion. Why is that? Because the areas of the brain that govern mood and personality are particularly affected by concussive blows to the head. Fortunately, we also know what you can do to improve your symptoms. But before we look at these healing factors, it's first crucial to understand both forms of domestic violence neurotrauma, not just concussion. So now let's take a look at what hypoxia is and how it occurs in domestic violence. Cerebral hypoxia simply means that something is disrupting oxygen flow to and from your brain. Why is that so important? Very simply, our brain is only about 2% of the size of our entire body, but it uses over 20% of our oxygen. After concussion, hypoxia is the second most frequent form of neurotrauma in domestic violence. So you can easily see that when oxygen deprivation or hypoxic injury occurs, the brain suffers the most. So now let's, let's look at three ways that hypoxia can occur in domestic violence. The most frequent form of hypoxic injury is strangulation. Some women call this being choked out. 
The second is getting smothered or suffocated. And the third is having your face and mouth deliberately held underwater. So inflicted or intentional drowning as part of a domestic violence episode. Here's an example of neck bruising from strangulation. The pressure on the neck of this woman that was capable of producing these bruises was likely sufficient to cause hypoxic neurotrauma. So now let's look at how little strangulation force it takes to literally choke off the brain's oxygen supply. We measure pressure on the neck from choking and strangling in pounds per square inch, also known as PSI. So a strong, firm handshake can involve 30 or 40 PSI, quite a bit. Closing the trachea, the windpipe, takes about 33 PSI, also quite a bit of pressure. But imagine popping the top on a soda can. It takes about 20 PSI to pop that top on a can of soda. Now let's look at how little pressure it takes to disrupt oxygen flow to the brain by squeezing the neck. It takes only five to 11 PSI. This is about half or less than the pressure it takes to open a soda can. How long does it take to start to have a brownout where things start to go dark before you completely black out? It involves those pressures, five to 11 PSI, occurring for only three to five seconds. By 10 or 11 seconds, you can completely pass out from disruption of oxygen supply to the brain. And what did these hypoxic injuries do to your mental functioning? Again, it can feel like things are starting to go dark, or you may even black out completely. A few hours later, but sometimes days, weeks, or even months later, you can feel like a sense of brain fog just like what we saw in repeated head injuries in DV, domestic violence. And because the memory centers of the brain require so much oxygen, you can have persistent problems with short-term memory, even though you can still remember events from months and even years ago with absolutely no difficulty. And just like what happens with repeated concussions in domestic violence, the attention, concentration, memory, and brain fog problems can last longer, sometimes even months or years, if you have repeated strangling, smothering, or other hypoxic events. So now let's look at how to get better from these dangerous domestic violence injuries. How can you start to feel improvement in some of these symptoms that we just discussed, the symptoms caused by neurotrauma. You can improve by focusing on two crucial life decisions. The first, you are hopefully already doing in your treatment program at the Westcare Foundation, either inpatient or residential. And what is that decision? Committing to total abstinence from alcohol and substances one day at a time. The second is making the active choice of no return to abusive romantic or living companions. These two lifestyle changes should reduce or eliminate further concussive blows to the head and any further events of hypoxia from abusive strangling or from respiratory or cardiac arrest that can occur during a drug overdose we're going to look much more at neurotrauma in substance abuse in a later video. So how much can you expect to recover from neurotrauma symptoms? There's a basic common sense formula. The fewer neurotraumas that you have, the less you will experience brain-related mood, thinking, memory, and other symptoms. If a lot of these neurotraumas have already happened in your life, then you are at a critical point of needing to prevent further brain injury events. How do you do that? Again, by making the same two 
important life choices of ceasing all abusive relationships and also of quitting all alcohol and substance abuse completely. Some domestic violence victims have actually asked me, well, what if I don't make these two choices or I make the choices and I don't stick to them? Well, we know that relapses are an unfortunate fact of life. You've heard about the 12 recovery steps. These steps require complete honesty. So in the spirit of total truthfulness, here's what can happen if you choose to return to abusive romantic partners or family members, or if you continue to abuse alcohol or substances. Very simply, you increase the chances that your neurotrauma symptoms will become more permanent. If you put yourself back into a lifestyle where further neurotrauma events from domestic violence do take place, you may even experience a progressive form of decline. This form of decline is very similar to a dementia, but instead of occurring in your 50s, 60s, 70s, or older, this form of decline can start to occur as early as your mid-30s to your mid-40s. So we've talked about a lot today. What can you do with all of this information? What is the bottom line? It's this. If you are young watching this video, it's never too soon. And if you're older, it's never too late to commit to these two life-changing decisions. This video may not save your life, but what you do with the information on this video can change your future. So I will leave you now to discuss with your counselors what you have learned today. I am very grateful to the West Care Foundation staff and the Pasco County Court staff that are part of this project. And I'm grateful to Lauren for producing this video. And thanks to all of you for being with us today.